So what we uh, heard last week, it's about Jesus being the one that provides and multiplies what people bring to him. And they have, uh, this, this young child has the uh, five loaves of bread, two fishes, so he has his tuna sandwiches, and God makes a multiplication. He feeds everybody through a very simple way, just by praying, just by breaking the bread, just by believing, he feeds all these people that needed food. Pastor Dave eloquently explained to us how uh, back in the days, a few foot security was something that was not guaranteed for about 80% of the people there. Here in the U.S., we have about closer to 18%, if I'm not mistaken, but it's some, something around, along, uh, along the, 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 that, that number. But the reality of people that didn't know where the next food is going to come, and they would always be looking for somebody that will provide the resource. So Jesus provided this resource for them. And now he becomes the target in a good way for them to see him as king, for, for them to see him as a political authority. They wanted Jesus to come and establish a visible kingdom that will take them away from oppression and the Roman Empire and everything that was done against them. This is what's happening right there in John chapter 6. It is interesting that right when Jesus does the miracle and people are crying for him to be more influential and for him to be more powerful and for people to give him the power, Jesus retreats. And he goes away from all the people. He hides in the mountain. He goes to pray. He kind of does the opposite of what we see happening today in the political scene that we are always living. No matter what country you live in, there's always going to be a political power that is going to be um, uh, a, a uh, just just the the uh, materializes the the greed of the people. No matter what party you you sympathize with, at the end of the day. I feel like there is one political party, <laughs> politicians. And they want to do what they want for themselves. And they understand that power is important. They understand that influence is important. Jesus understood that power was important, but he understood the power didn't come from the masses. It came from God. He understood that his authority didn't come from oppression. It came from servanthood. <laughs> so can you go to the next one, brother? Let's introduce what we're going to speak about today. Today, it's about understanding that Jesus is always with us as he walks into the water. So this is a miracle, another sign of Jesus walking on water. And I want us to see this because it's right after he gets the multiplication. Instead of him going in and trying to take advantage of people, now the people see that he is the one that re to give them the resource. Jesus stops, goes away. And he sends his disciples away as well to teach them again to trust in God. And I want to just stop for a second because it feels to me, and for those of us that have been walking with Jesus for a little bit, and maybe this is not your first rodeo when it comes to a church community, maybe you, you, you realize that you have that one thing, that one season in your life where you were very connected to God, you felt very connected to God, and you feel, can there be anything else? And I remember going through moments with Jesus that I was like, wow, this is pretty amazing. Like, I don't think God could top this. <laughs> like, I, I'm like, you know, I'm trying to fit God into my limited mindset. And I would see God continually doing something bigger and better. But it's always going to come through a process of a miracle, a time of retreat and solitude. And Jesus is trying to teach this to the disciples. And he sends them out. Now, after this big sign, now he's about to show them something deeper. And he goes and retreats to the mountain. In John, if you go to the next one, I want to give you the references of the three times where th this comes out. In Matthew 14, 22, 34, Mark, and John. Out of the four gospels, understand that the gospels in the New Testament are four people telling the same story. And a lot of people get a little bit shook up when they understand, like, wait, why do we have so many Gospels? Why do we have these four Gospels? Reality is that this is something that gives us an, another uh, confirmation. Because the fact that they all have different views helps us to confirm that this is a real story. When stories look the same, very much the same, you wonder if it wasn't rehearsed. You know what I'm talking about? Like, when you ask your child something, and they just tell you something like, wait, how did you know? 
I was going to say that. <laughs> like, like you knew, you were preparing, you were rehearsing something. It doesn't come naturally, right? So the fact that we have different gospels, it helps us to understand they're not trying to, to prove anything to anybody. They're just trying to state the facts. And they're trying to say it from their own perspective. And again, this is not a New Testament class, but I just want you to know, like, wait, why do we have the same story in different spots? This is where, where it goes. So today, although we've been going on John, I want to take the story of Mark that's right to the point, and we could see what's going on there. So go to, go to Mark chapter 6, verse 45 to 52. You can follow along on the screens. You can follow along in the apps or in your printed Bible. And it says, as, uh, it goes uh, as this, it says, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. Notice those things. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on land, on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully. For the wind was against them, and about the fourth watch of the night, which is about 3 a.m. in the morning, he came to them walking on the sea, and he meant to pass by them. Notice the, the joke there, right? But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and, say, and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind, the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Let us pray. God, we pray. That today we'll be able to breathe and just listen to your voice and to your word, to connect with it and to grow in it, Lord God, today. Fathers, some of us are praying for miracles. Some of us are living uh, a, a season of miracles. Lord, whatever season we may be going through, Father, today we're encountering your word. And your word is enough for us, no matter our season. So we pray, Holy Spirit, speak to us today once again. We need you, God. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let me show you this map about what they call the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee was really more of a lake. And before my son was born, my wife and I had the privilege of actually going to Israel, going to the Holy Land, going to Palestine and Israel. And one of the things that I appreciate from that trip, to be honest with you, I was so concerned about like, how, you know, we're looking forward to Jerusalem and all the sites where the crucifixion and the resurrection happened and yes we have booked time up in the north area which is here Galilee but it was the most surprising area for me I was not expecting to see the the valley and how lush and green it is right in the middle of the desert this is just a, a different kind of place it's it's about to hit Lebanon and and the beauty of the Greek the greenery of that area and the Jordan River and there's a lot of resources that are there so this is a lake, and, 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 and we were able to just try to find local, what the locals do. So we went kind of on the other side, and we were able to drive and see if you could show the next picture. This is kind of like a little bit of a 3D um, kind of view, because the idea is for you to see that there's mountains all around, small mountains all around it. And at some spot, you're going to have Jesus. There's a current church there. There's churches everywhere when there is a significant uh, biblical um, uh, event. So there's a church right where the feeding of the 5,000 happened. And you could kind of see, you know, where was Jesus moving? Where was he going to? And how the boat goes. Because although it's a lake, it's still pretty, pretty long and wide. And it has, because of the mountains all around it, it has this tropical um, weather that brings out this sudden little storms. So the definition is that there was a big storm. What is happening is that Jesus is up in the mountains and he's able to see the sea. And in a bright day, I mean bright night with full moon, you can actually see the boats there. So the idea of this is for you to see that Jesus is praying up in the mountain, but he's able to see them. He's sending them out, but Jesus is able to see them. When we are obeying God's word, many times, I, when I read this part specifically, verse 
verse 48. Verse 48 says, and he saw them, Jesus saw that they were making headway painfully. And I stopped for a second. I was like, bro, that's me sometimes. Like, I'm not saying that I'm stuck. I'm just saying that I'm making headway painfully. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, we're moving forward in our marriage, but sometimes it feels like it's painful. Like, sometimes we're moving with our, our the the challenges that we may have with our children and it feels like we are making headway but we're making headway painfully anybody with me today just me it's like we are moving forward you got me and this is what i want you to understand the bible is not trying to show there was a big big storm it was trying to show that there was wind that was against them and because the wind was against them the water was moving and the water was a little bit in unrest and it made them, although they were going somewhere, they were doing it in a painful way. It cost them so much. It felt like they were putting a lot of effort and there was little movement. Anybody has felt like that sometimes? You can breathe. Because what I want to encourage you today is to know that no matter what, Jesus is still with us. Jesus went away to pray, but he's still watching. He's still with them. He is close to them. He knows that he's just able to walk because he sent us out. He sent the disciples out to the other side. He's trying to teach them to go deeper in the reliance of Jesus and knowing that God is the provider in all things. At the end, the account in Mark says that they didn't understand. So all this is connected. The feeding of the 5,000, it was a pretty big deal. Check out last week's preaching. It was great preaching that Pastor Dave gave to us last week. But think about this, because this is exactly what they're just not getting. They're not understanding that Jesus is trying to present himself, not as the one that feeds their tummy and their, their stomachs by giving them bread, but that he is the bread of life. And many times, God got to put us in a situation where we feel that there is conflict. So that way we can realize that Jesus is what we need at all times. And if we are obedient to his voice, this is not the Jonah story. This is not the, the, the storm that comes when disobedience comes. This is a, a, a little bit of, of wind that is coming against us when we are obeying God's voice. Do you understand what I'm talking to you? When we are obedient, when we are following what Jesus is telling us to do. So it's okay. It's not going to be always a breeze. Not all the time the wind is going to go in our favor. Sometimes, even as we are obeying Jesus, the wind is going to come a little against us. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because we got we, we, we to gotta change our theology, people. American church got to change our theology. People understand you're coming to Christ and that's it. No more pain. Pain-free Christianity. It was never like that. But that's what we want because anything that's going to be pain-free, hey, sign me up. Come on, moms. You know, all the, 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 the pains of being a mom, right? You know, and it's amazing. It's beautiful. The beautiful. It's a beautiful season for our church. So many moms are giving birth. Like, there's a, new, a lot of new moms. Like, I have, I have like two or uh, three different moms that just came to, to that, that from our church. They gave birth, like, in the past two weeks. About two, two days ago, uh, Sister Manjali, you might know her in Orlando, she had the baby. And it's amazing. It's amazing to see the birth. And they sent me the, the, the video. And, you know, I don't know why you did that, but like hand cutting the umbilical cord. And I was like, thank you for that, Pastor Confidence, you know, but I didn't need to see that, brother. Thank you. But, but I'm happy for you. I'm happy for you. Because that's what it does. When you become a mom, you become a dad. It's, a, it's, it's, it's so unexplainable. It's a beautiful feeling. But it's painful. They told me. I don't know. <laughs> my, my, my wife, her first child, she had preeclampsia. Her, her um, blood pressure was super high. So we were in the hospital for about maybe three days before they decided to just start like, doing it, to inducing her for, for, for birth. And then they wound up being C-section. But seeing the pain of that, you know? We don't, we don't realize there's going to be joy coming after, <laughs> but the moment is painful. And, and I want to invite you to think about this. You see, the idea is that Jesus is walking on water. 
And I love the Bible, how funny it is that it tells us that Jesus, in verse 48, right at the end, it says, And walking on the sea, he meant to pass by them. And I'm like, what, what does that even mean? Like, you got to ask questions to the text. As you're reading the Bible, that's supposed to be funny. Tell me now. Like, Jesus was going to be like, hey, guys, what's going on? <laughs> like, like, he meant, that's what it says. Am I reading it wrong? What do you guys see there? Because that's what I said. Like, he meant to just pass by. Like, Jesus is like, I'm praying. I'm about to walk on water. I'm going to casually just pass by them and just be like, hey, Peter, what's up? Like, nothing is happening. And then because he sees that they're go going through struggle, that they're having a hard time, then he stops. And I love, this is something that sometimes it happens to us, and I wonder if it happens to you. In the middle of the, of, of the storm and of the, 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 the wind that comes against us, many times Jesus is trying to reveal himself to us. And we're like, is this a ghost? Is this really God talking to me? Is this really God wanting me to get closer to him? And there's a lot of people, somebody, one day they call me, hey man, I feel the call to being a pastor. And you think God is speaking to me? I'm like, bro, the devil won't be speaking to you about serving God like that. So yes, of course, go for it. Get ready, get trained, do what you got to do. Follow God. We all call to pastoring. Now the question is how God wants you to pastor. Maybe it's your home, maybe it's your small business, maybe it's in a church. I don't know that. Then allow God to figure that out for you. But right now, be obedient. Be obedient. Jesus sent us to the next, to the next level, to the other side, then we'll go. In the midst of the situation, I love that when they wonder what they're seeing, Jesus answers with this statement. So you could go there. In verse 50. Verse 50, Jesus says, For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. When Jesus is saying, it is I, it right away connects to when God revealed himself, when Yahweh revealed himself to Moses in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 3. And because back in the day, there was just a way for people to understand how the gods used to work. It had to be about understanding, like, hey, what's the name of your god? Because there was a god for fertility. There was a god for prosperity, prosperity for love, for, for the war. There was a, a god for many different things. So when he is trying to say, well, Moses is saying to God, hey, listen, you're calling me to go and deliver the people and set my people free. How, what, what is your name? In verse 3, verse 13 says, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said this to the people of Israel. And say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Think about this statement. Because God is the God that is limitless. And he's telling us today, I don't want to be your small God that you carry me with you in your iPod or in, in, in your iPhone or in your, your, your pocket. I don't want to be that God that you just put in your, in, in, in your purse. I want to be a God that is always with you no matter what. I am that I am. You need God to be your provider. I am the provider. I, you need God to be your healer. He's saying, I am. You fill in the blank. I am. I am. I am that I am. So when Jesus speaks to the disciples and he's telling them, hey, take heart. It is I. Say this. It's me. It's the I am. Take heart. It is I. It is the I am. Take heart. I Do not be afraid. I am is with you. I am is walking with us. No matter what, I am is work, walking with us. And it don't, it don't matter what it is that we're going through. It don't matter what you think you may be going through. Know this. I am is with you. Can you say that to yourself? I am is with me. I am is with me. 
It's hard to think that God is the one that can be enough for us in every area of our lives. And I know we're always depending on other things. We're depending on other people. God is inviting us once again to realize, hey, take heart. It is I. It is the I am. Do not be afraid. Now, the reality is this. At the end of the day, when God is with us, he's always going to push us to do things that are out of our comfort zone. Amen, somebody? God is always going to tell us to do something different that is out of our comfort zone. There's a saying that I got from my mom. This is something she will always remind me. Can you put the next one? She says this. Leave it, don't do stupid things. That's like right in the middle, especially when I was a kid. You know, don't move, don't play around. Why would they put a five-year-old kid a white suit right before our wedding? Why would they do that? They think it's cute. If I was cute, I was like, oh, the little groom, the little groom, the little bride. I remember they did that. And it's like, don't do anything stupid. You know, don't, don't play around. Don't fool around. And that always continues then in the teenage years, right? Hey, don't do something that you might regret. And in their own way, every mom has their own way of saying this. Amen, people? Everybody has a mom, so don't say you don't have a mom. <laughs> right? Like, they got a way of saying this. And usually, it goes like, hey, be careful. I was just reading something on this, right? That The idea of be careful as a parent when you tell somebody, hey, be careful, you got to watch what you're really telling your kids because it, 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 it comes from a place of fear. It comes from a place of care, but you got to be specific on what they're being careful about. You can't just leave it open-ended. It's like, hey, be careful because this could harm you. Yesterday, my daughter has been looking forward to doing um, uh, breakfast in bed for her mom. And I love her heart. She's beautiful. She's seven years old, and she has this heart of just service. She's like a little secretary because she's always on top of things. Like, there's a day that my, my son had to go to drum class, and we all forgot. We're just hanging out on a Saturday morning, and my, my daughter's like, hey, Jace, no, drum class. I was like, all right, we got to go. So, like, honestly, we're gonna, like, we were 50 minutes uh, away from the place, and we had to, like, go at that moment. So she was planning this the whole week, and she's, they're like, Figuring out what they're gonna cook for mom and and, and thank God for, for kids' songs because there was a, a a song that they love about like breakfast burritos and they're like, there you go, that's what I want to get. <laughs> so finally, you know, we're like, all right, we're gonna get a breakfast burrito. But yesterday we're doing the this the, this um breakfast for mom, and at some point we have a um you know, I'm cooking the 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 you know, just just I'm handling the stove um duty. And my daughter notices in our electric stove something red. And she tells me, what is that red thing? I'm like, that's the fire. If you have an electric stove, that's what, that's what gives it heat. And that's electricity trying to put heat into this pan. So right away, I am trying to explain to her. Because if I don't explain to her, she will probably, you know, do something stupid and put her finger there. And then we got to go to the hospital, and then it's like, it's done. Mom's breakfast in bed didn't work, right? Or she would just be afraid, and that's what happened to me. The first time I, I realized that a hot, um, a hot pot was bad for me, I was just hanging out. I was six years old. I remember just there, and I just put my, like, that just got close to it. I had a sleeveless shirt, and next thing you know, I feel like this big pain. And I'm like, ah, I started crying, and next thing you know, I had a, a second-degree burn. Because I didn't know. Because when you don't know and you have that experience, then you're afraid of what's about to come next. Well, I want to tell you that when you are trusting Jesus and he is telling you, that, and you hear all the time, be careful, don't touch this, don't touch that. It seems a little bit hard to understand when God is telling us, hey, if you're doubtful in your season, maybe you need to step out of your comfort zone. Maybe you need to go into a place where I need to put you with a little bit of headwind that is against you in order for you to trust me in this moment. Because let's be honest, if we had no issues, would we really pray intensely the way that we sometimes pray? Think about the last time you prayed for somebody to get healed, somebody you really, really, really love. You prayed a little different. Come on, somebody. You pray.
prayed with a little bit of more um, uh, um, fire when you really needed to pay for something. And you knew that there was, a, there was a blessing, a financial blessing that could have come. You know that it tastes different when God makes you step out of your comfort zone. And if we go to the same account in Matthew chapter 14, I want you to think this with me, and I want you to see it with me. So I'm, I'm going to do this, and let's see if uh, Alexis, uh, let's do it, let's do it. Let's see if it works out. So I'm going to read this, and Alexis is going to help me out to put some background music to this account. Okay, uh, give her a round of applause, Alexis. She has no idea of what this is gonna go for, but let's see. So let's let's do like Sea of Galilee music. There you go. She got that. Perfect. So <laughs> think about this. Go go for it. You know, just like there we go. That sounds very Sea of Galilee. -ish. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. Terrified music. Terrified. There we go. And said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Jesus is about to talk music. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Pause the music for a second. Pause the music for a second. And we're going to do it again. When I say he said come, that's the moment we got to like keep it. Like, in suspense. And Peter, wait, go back. There. And Peter answered him, Lord, it is you. If it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. Now, that's the part you're supposed to pause. Okay. And he said, come. There you go. Round of applause for Alexis. She got it. She got it. <laughs> you can continue with the music. Because I want you to think with me. Continue with the music. You can continue. Yeah. yeah, sorry. So Peter got out the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. And I want you to think about this with me. Think about Peter thinking about the ghost and he is trying to get the ghost to just go I'm pretty sure and he has his brother Andrew trying to talk him out of like going out of the boat and reminding Peter Peter you don't know how to swim Peter Peter what you doing we, we you fun swimming class but think about the situation where Peter speaks to the ghost and the ghost actually responds, yeah, come out. Pause for a second. Think about this for a second. When have you prayed to God to do something great in your life? And then Jesus actually said, all right, come. All right, do it. Step out of your boat. Open up that business. Trust somebody and actually get married. Trust somebody and actually do whatever it is from the blank. Start a ministry, open up a church in Jersey City. This is multicultural, but nobody else understands it. Think about this for a second. When have you asked God, God, yeah, if it's you, allow me to walk. Because you're not like, oh, that's so big. That's never going to happen. You go back to the music. You're there again on the Sea of Galilee, right? Ready to see? The power of Alexis and her music. Jesus said, come to Peter, saying, listen, I am that I am. If you believe in me, I'm believing in you. 
So step out of your boat and come and do the extraordinary, something that has never been done. Do the impossible. Walk with me. I am God. And Jesus said, just come. So Peter got out the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw and came to Jesus, but when he saw the wind, you go to the next one. Verse 30. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took a hold of him, saying to him, all oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got out into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. A lot of people focus on the fact that Peter sunk. And yes, he did. Yes, he felt the wind. It was different. It felt different inside the boat than outside the boat. Amen, somebody? It felt different inside the boat because it was cozy. It was still hard, but it was cozy. It felt secure. It felt safe. And in that place, when he moved out, now he's in the place of the wind. He's feeling the, the pressure. He's knowing that he's doing something that is out of the ordinary. And he begins to sink. Thank you, Alexis. Can you give a round of applause to Alexis? Thank you for your Sea of Galilee music today. It amazes me that as people see Peter sinking, they forget about how amazing it is what he's doing. And I want to encourage you to think about this. Pastor Dave, a few weeks ago, speaking about the moment when the guy gets healed by the pool, spoke to us about how when people, you know, they always have something to say when, when they see a miracle in our lives. Like, everybody has an opinion. Everybody has a, a, a way of how things should, be, should, should have happened or what you should do afterwards. And they have their own story, and they want to kind of, push it out and post it in you, not understanding that God has a way of working with all of us in a different different way, different style. He speaks to all of us in a different way. Even if you're married, understand that. God is going to speak to you differently. You just have to be aware. And I want you to just encourage one another because at the end of the day, if somebody stepped out of their boat, even if you're trying something and it doesn't work out, man, you did it. You step out of the boat. You step out of the comfort, and it was secure. And you started doing things. Everything that is big is going to take guts to do it. Everything that is amazing, any the big challenge is going to take a lot in you. People are married. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's the most beautiful thing to be married, to be have somebody as a companion to you in, in thick and thin. But it's so some days that you, you wish it's like... You know, I, I, I want to hug you very tightly around your neck. No, just kidding. Oh. That's what my wife told me. No, just kidding. <laughs> Being a, a parent is amazing. But come on. There are days, you know. <laughs> Somebody says that, you know, when they're small, very, very cute. And you're like, oh, my God, I'm going to eat them, right? They become teenagers, you're like, why didn't I eat them? You know, like. So many days, you know, that you want to quit. And I just want to encourage you to know that God was the one that told you to step out. Step out of your boat. And every time there's going to be a new challenge, God is telling us, step out of your boat. Don't look at the wind. You're walking on water. Don't, I know you're going to feel it. It, it, it. it feels like you're sinking. It's okay as long as you know that God is with you. That God is close to you. That God is moving with you. Look at these Bible verses. Go with me, please. Just move to the next ones. And, and, and uh, in Psalm chapter 20, 
Psalms 20 verse 7, it says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Anybody say amen to that? We believe in the name of God. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In John 14, 1, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. This is Jesus speaking to us. As I close out today, I want to encourage you to know and to evaluate and realize that what you have already done, the walk that you have in Christ, for those of you that have stepped out of your comfort zone, and I've been saying yes to God to serve him and any other teams here in the church, but also in things that you're doing outside of the church, there's no way that you could be serving people if it does not inconvenience you. Ministry is inconvenient. Parenting is inconvenient. Having a strong marriage is inconvenient at times. Being a good pastor is inconvenient. Being a good boss is, just, is inconvenient. Having a good business is going to be inconvenient. Your employees will turn around you. There's going to be things that will come against you, but understand one thing. All of this is worth it because God is with us. And the beautiful thing is in the middle of that, even if I feel that I'm sinking, when I know that God is with me, I'm going to be okay. Because I love to have this picture that Peter is sinking. He stepped out of the boat. He's sinking. But it says that God then brought him, Jesus brought him back to the boat. I wonder how he did that. I think that's pretty amazing. Because I want to imagine Jesus carrying him. I want to imagine Jesus taking his strength and carrying Peter. Be like, Peter, you're not only going to be the only man that walked on water besides me, but you're also going to be the only man that I actually carry in my shoulders. You know what's so beautiful? What is beautiful is that every time when we connect with Jesus in that way, you know it's really from God because what you want to do is just worship him. At the end of it, at, at the end of it, verse 32, it says that the wind ceased, and those in the boat, they worship him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. That's, we are, that's why we are a worshiping church. We don't, we're not a church that sings songs. We're a church on the same that every week, every day, we need to give thanks to God. Because if we are in awe and we understand what God has done in our lives, there is nothing else that you want to do but just thank God. You're like, I know God is crazy. And I want you to understand, this story is not trying to give us all the beautiful things or everything is flawless. Peter, the disciples, are going in obedience of God's voice. They find that there's contrary winds and doesn't let them move to the speed that they wanted. Everything is for God's glory, and he's treating them. He's working with them. He's shaping them for them to understand that sometimes obeying God's voice is going to be rough. But he's always with us. Amen, somebody? Rise with me and let us pray. Thank you, God. Can you worship God for some of the hard winds in your life? The winds that are coming sometimes against us. The, although you may be making headway, but you're making headway painfully. <laughs> you're making headway in a way that sometimes it just hurts. Be at peace. You're obeying. You're showing up. Liberty Church, you're showing up to God. You're not showing up to me. You're showing up to God. If you're here visiting for the first time, you're here because God brought you. He has a purpose for your life. And there was something in your heart that said, man, I got I to gotta seek for God. I got to look for God. I'm going to check out this church. And, and again, you know, we're not going to be perfect because we're people. But one thing I assure you, you step out of your comfort zone and you are here. And God wants to touch your heart, and he wants to work in you, and he wants to work through you. Though you are all complicated, though we are all with our own issues, he is not calling perfect people. He's calling willing people. He's not calling perfect people. He's calling willing people. Are you willing? 
for God to use you. If that's you, can you raise, raise your hand with me? If that's you, say, God, use me in a different way. I want to step out of my comfort zone. I already got my things. I re- I'm already doing things. I, I, I'm already doing some good things, but I want you to use me. And God has seen your hand, and I see you. And in the name of Jesus, I pray that God will give you strength. That God will give you the strength to do the work that God is calling you to do. Do not be afraid, but know that God is with you. Put your trust in Jesus. Put your trust in Jesus today. Can you pray a prayer of trust? Say, God, I trust you. I want to trust you again. I'm sorry if I didn't trust you. I'm sorry if I'm not trusting you enough and I'm trying to make riches on my own strength. I'm sorry if I've been trying to work on my own marriage and the, with my own strength and, and with my parenting in my own strength. God, I need you. I need you, Jesus. I need you, God. Even in the areas that I have success, it's being painful. Lord, please take my load. Take my weight. Take everything that is weighing me down. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray this. I give my life to you. And I thank you for your love in my life. In the name of Jesus, amen.